Hello learners, hope you are keeping well. And now, as I promised you, uh, we've done part of the uh, map work revision. Okay, and that was called part one. Okay, we're doing map work revision now, part two. Okay, so it's map work revision. Remember, it's not just general revision, but map work revision. And it's part two. In this one, I'm actually going to focus on the interpretation and the GIS. Okay, and of course, we have used the paper you recommended that you wanted me to do it on, the 2019 NSC November paper. Okay, and again, it's about strategies. Uh, you may not get the same questions. If you're lucky, you get the same questions, but it's about strategies that can be used uh, to answer map work papers. Now, in the first part, you saw how many answers were just taken from the resources and the general information. Okay, that made the work so much easier. It's the same for these sections, learners. It's about knowing your theory and knowing, of course, your map work skills and how you apply it. That's the important thing. All right, how you apply the thing. All right, so let's get going with this. Now you see, application and interpretation is your question three. Okay, now it says, each time gives you a little reference. Remember like in the first part, yeah, it also tells you either the block you must use or where you must refer to the topographic map, the autophoto map. So please read those instructions. In this case, it says refer to the Pongola River on that topographic map. And of course, this is the river, the Pongola River. Okay, now, first question, what type of river is the Pongola River. You did permanent or perennial, you did non-perennial, you understand? Those are the types of rivers. And if you look at the key, the reference, it shows you solid blue lines are perennial and the broken blue lines are non-perennial. So it's as easy as that. All you did was basically look at the reference, look at the river, and you know it's perennial. There was a little bit of a higher order question, all right, which was quite interesting, and it involves your geomorphology. Okay, so let's have a look at this, learners. It said, will an oxbow lake more likely form first at meander R or meander loop S. Okay, interesting. And it says give a reason for your answer. So let's look at these two meander loops. All right. Now we see down here, it's wider at R and it's narrower at S. Can you see it? Wider at R and narrow at S. And we've learned about an oxbow lake. As uh, the process occurs, the neck gets narrower and narrower, and eventually it gets narrower and narrower. You understand? And eventually, as it gets so narrow, okay, that position and various processes cuts through, this piece gets separated. So it's a nice question to think about, okay? That this one is narrower here compared to this one. So where it will more likely, okay, we can never say for sure, more likely will occur will be at S. Can you see it? All right. At S, can you see we can work things out? We need to apply, and that is why I say whether it's map work or whether it's theory, the application needs to be done. All right, we can see that. Okay, so we see here what could be the reasons. Okay, 
S has a softer, less resistant rock. Okay, could be possibility that it's there. All right, S is more easily eroded than R. That is why it's narrower. There are more resistant rock at Miele Rup R and it'll take longer to erode. Okay, the neck of the loop at R is wider than the meander at S. That was the most obvious one. Okay, you spotted it already. There could be various other reasons which need to be included. Why is it narrowing there? You understand because it's softer rock compared to there, right? But this is the one you noticed eh? more than anything else. Okay. And there's other reasons the meander loop at R is more elevated while the land at meander loop A is more gentle. So we get more of this erosion, etc., happening. Okay. But the big one was there was the neck loop. Okay. Is wider at R than the loop at S or S is narrower than the loop at R. Okay, but you have to observe that. That is why both were given to you. Okay, let's look at this. Now, this was a photograph, a uh, piece taken from the photograph. It shows you little farmsteads down here, which seem to be here, and it's showing you they are further apart. So most probably is dealing with pattern, eh? Right, let's check. Uh, refer to settlement 10 on the auto photo map. Name the settlement pattern. Remember again, pattern is isolated, okay, or nucleated, you understand, or dispersed or, and nucleated. All right, so pattern shape is linear, uh, crossroads, whatever. Okay, that's different. Eh? Remember the shape and the pattern. This is the pattern. So when I look at this, you can see they are further apart. Okay, that's what it's pointing to. And the examiner has made it easy. It's shown you little lines showing you they are far apart. Okay, so the answer would be dispersed or isolated alternate answers. Right. Now let's look at another one. Name one physical and important to read properly and highlight. It's not a human-made factor. It's a physical or natural factor that would have determined the type of settlement pattern. Okay, now you must remember these things are far. Okay, so there would be enough fertile, gentle land, etc., that you've learned in your settlement. Okay. And if there was a shortage of water, it'll be close together to the water source. You understand? Okay. So it'll be a wet point settlement. Okay. So you learn that. Now you need to apply it basically to a dispersed settlement. Okay, what you can see clearly here, the, the contour lines, what is very evident here is that it is flat land. So they can be spread out. Okay, there's fertile soil, which we, is one of the factors, maybe not as visible, but it's fertile soil and there's enough fertile soil available so they can farm enough rainfall so they don't need to be near the source of the water so they can spread out. So there's excess to water supply. Of course, these two can be very closely related, but you only needed one. Okay, so can you see how it's related? All right, but it has to be a physical or natural factor. All right, now, Let's look at the next question. State two economic advantages. Economic that will make the person benefit monetary wise, etc., of this type of settlement pattern. Generally, the dispersed settlements are larger and it's more commercial, not always, but it's generally commercial. All right, you've learned that already. Okay, it's large scale farming. Okay, our grade 12 concept, large scale farming. 
Okay, can you see the theory coming in into the map work here? All right, that is why you have to integrate it. All right, that is why you do it on the same day. So you know it's fresh in your head that you wrote the paper one, now you take the information and write paper two. Okay, all right, so look at this. Farmer can show initiative, new farming technology, innovative, and he can use it on a large scale. Farmer owns the land. That's the general case associated with large scale farming, etc. Farmer owns the land, so he can do and he can plant and produce, and the profits are his. Land is not fragmented, all right? It's not broken up into smaller pieces, okay? Uh, for different people, etc. Profits are small, okay? Farmer is able to mechanize extensively, use machinery, increase production, make more money. You understand? We're not giving full because it says state. It didn't say fully explain. Can you see the difference also? That is why it's two times one. Two points stated, one mark each. All right? Can you see? Farmer doesn't have to share his profits. Can you see? All this is related because he's large scale. He owns it. It's his thing. He doesn't have to share a profit. It's not communal farming. You understand? He he has it on his own. All right. And we're just stating, we didn't say explain how, why he doesn't have to share his farming. It says state to. I'm not going to go through the whole list. You will have the memo with you. But do you get the idea? It's again settlement geography that comes in here. All right, economic geography that comes in in various sections, climate, geomorphology, all right, but this now is clearly there, okay? Right, let's look at the next one. I see the aerodrome has popped up again, eh? The aerodrome, all right, it says refer to the aerodrome in block D7. All right, and there's it. This is block around block D7. Sorry, the aerodrome is here. Okay, now that doesn't mean I look at that, I can look at it at nine on the auto photo map. It's here also. I can get a view of the things around it, etc. Okay, now it brings in land use zones. Now, immediately, aerodrome. And which land use its zone it's put in. You've learned it already in the theory. And if you learn you learned it smartly and properly, you don't even need to think anymore. It's an aerodrome. You understand it's on the outskirts. Uh, there's pollution, dangers of accidents, noise. So it's more on the outskirts, isn't it? So uh, between the rural and uh, an urban area. So you know already it's the rural urban fringe. If you see the aerodrome, Rural urban fringe. It's not in the center of an urban area. You understand? In the center of the CBD, etc. Okay, so you picked it up already. Basically, as soon as you identified this, you understand, you can answer questions on it. Now, look at this. Why is this land use zone in a, uh, why is this land use zone a suitable location for this aerodrome? Read the question carefully. Why is this land use zone, the rural urban fringe, a suitable location for the aerodrome? Why is the aerodrome there? And you've already learned so many factors on that. You understand? Okay, we looked at various uh, uh, natural factors, flat land, cheaper land to build on. Correct. You've picked this up before. Availability of large open space, okay, in the area, okay, because it's open, right, accessibility to the road, we looked around here, we found roads in the area, all right, avoid accidents and for safety reasons, that's one of the popular ones you learned, look at the options given to avoid Due to air and noise pollution, you learn that if it's in right in the in the city, all right, it's too much pollution, air, noise, etc. You don't want it. It's away from the built-up area, okay, because of noise, accidents, pollution, etc. Okay, uh, uh, light and then various other options have been given. Light aircraft could be used to spray insecticides and pesticides. Most probably, many of you would not pick on that. 
all right? But examiners give you as many options as possible. They talk about pesticides in the uh, rural area for the cultivated crops, etc. But you have enough that you have studied already. Can you see? But you looked at it and it does make sense. Why pesticides were given? Because there's cultivated lands around it. All right, can you see it? Okay, uh, let's go on. Now, I've given the general information and I showed you an area on the map. And again, I do apologize for the slight blurring of it. Okay, uh, I don't have a scanner, so I'm here asking others to actually do it for me. Okay, but let's look at the question before we look at the source. Okay, refer to agricultural activities in the map area. Okay, that's what it's looking at. All right. Now, is sugarcane farming shown on the map an example of large scale or small scale farming? You see, what sugarcane? Oh, all of a sudden it's sugarcane. Yes, you would be saying that if you did not read the general information and if you go back to the general information you can see pergola is surrounded by 50 square kilometers of sugar cane already telling you it's large you understand beside looking at the map there's the sugar mill yeah can you see the large area okay telling you it's large-scale farming. Can you see that general information also? Don't forget about it, all right? And you can see it on the map, okay? So it's large-scale farming, all right? That's how you got it. Now, discuss the irrigation network, uh, discuss how the irrigation network on the eastern part of the mapped area supports growing of sugarcane. All right, on the eastern part of the mapped area. All right, uh, there's various furrows, etc. Can you see it? That's happening here. So it's an irrigation network distributing the water to various areas. Very clear to be seen here. And it's written here also. The irrigation canal system, can you see it? Allows water to be spread through the area because we have mostly summer rainfall and the irrigation system. Sugarcane needs a lot of water and 500 millimeters, 519 millimeters of rainfall. So sugar needs a lot of water, all right, to come through. So the irrigation system distributes it. Can you see, maybe you didn't come across the word irrigation system, but you can work it out from here. So you will get those out of the box questions, eh? That you will have to think about, but there's little hints found in the general information, etc. And once you picked it up, you can go through the answers. Look at this. Irrigation network will increase sugarcane production, therefore increase profits. A general statement, but it's fine because it says, how does the irrigation network support the growing of sugarcane? There's two parts to it. Eh? It's specific to the growing of sugar cane and how the irrigation network supports it. So the irrigation network will increase sugar cane production, therefore increase profits. Okay, so we know we can get specific questions to that map, what's found on that map. The irrigation network is easier, cheaper way to transport water over considerable distances. You see how the water is being transported in the area. You understand, to different areas. It allows it to be transported. Okay, uh, the area only receives 519 millimeters of rainfall. Therefore, the irrigation network is in, essential to ensure all year productivity. And beside 19 millimeter, 519 millimeters of rainfall, most of it is in winter. So the irrigation network will support production all through the year. You understand? Can you see some difficult answers? So certain things will be specific to the map. Don't get shocked. I haven't looked at irrigation networks. We didn't study it there fully. We may have used the concept, but we didn't apply it. Yes, you will get questions that are specific to that map, which you have to answer. Okay, so don't get scared. Look at the information given and you will be able to answer. I'm just going to do one more. The irrigation network allows for farmers to access water 
so that the crops can be grown away from the river. They all gone. This is a large scale farming. So furrows will allow the water to be pumped from the river and taken away. You understand? To other areas because of the large scale farming. You can see the furrows from the rivers going through in every direction. So we don't have to farm next to the river. So certain ones you have to work out, learners, but it's not difficult. Okay, so you looked at that. Let's look at the next one. Refer to the shug Pongola sugar mill. Okay, and there's the sugar mill down here. Pongola sugar mill, right next to the uh, area where the sugar cane is grown. Can you see it around here? Okay, let's look at what questions they want here. Is the sugar mill raw material or market orientated? Can you see the interesting things now? Okay, from the theory, raw material or market orientated. Can you see how you need to relate? So one important thing when you go through your theory, sit with the map also as you're doing your theory. See whichever can be related. You understand? Uh, climate, catabatic, and whatever can be related to the map in a valley. You understand? Uh, if you look at this, raw material. Okay, geomorphology, you see in the relationship. Meanders, oxbow lakes, etc. Relate them same time. Say, how can I put it into a map? So while I'm studying, have a map next to me. Say, can I use this in a map? We don't know. You understand there's a certain amount of uh, or less uh, questions that are unpredictable, okay, that can come out. So prepare yourself for that. Now we look at this and we look at the map carefully. We see the thing that's around it is the crop sugarcane being grown. The emphasis is on the raw material because it's bulky. So because of that, we say raw material. All right, can you see it? All right, and of course, then you got your reasons. Sugarcane is bulky to transport and that increases the cost. So why take bulky goods to a sugar mill that's far away? Have the sugar mill next to the raw material so that you save on transport costs. Sugar mills process the sugarcane close to the plantation. That's a raw material, all right? Or the word raw material, close to it. Okay, you can see it on the map, isn't it? That it's close to the sugar cane, which is the raw material. So it's evident there. So therefore it's raw material. Sugar cane requires quick processing as it can dry out instead of transportation. So you do it first. That's now a fact about it. Maybe some of you don't know that, but the fact is that you already got the answer here. Can you see it in the first ones? Okay, so there will be some that maybe you don't know fully, but there's so many options that it's given to you. All right. Okay, so you got that. Right, now I'm not going to go through all the answers. Now watch this, learners. It says give a reason, right? And some of you look at the word give, you just make one word there. Transport. Watch out, learners. Be very careful. Look at the mark allocation. It's one times two. It means one factor properly explained. So always look at the mark allocation. Yeah, you all it says give, you have to give a proper explanation. Like you say, yeah, sugarcane is bulky to transport, and that increases the cost if it's far away. Okay, sugarcane uh mills process the sugarcane close to the plantations, and as it's evident on the map. Okay, sugarcane needs to be quickly processed because it can dry out. Can you see fully explained because of this? Can you see there? Very important, eh? Right, let's go on. This question referred to settlement Pakamisa and large below means it made bigger, all right, it's not put to scale. Situated in the valley in block J4, okay? Right in block J4 on the topographic map. Examiner says it's in a valley. Sometimes we may, people can contest or whatever. There's a spur, there's this, there's that. You understand, found in between. 
go with the instruction of the examiner. The examiner says in a valley. All right, stop questioning other things. You can do it afterwards, but now you stick because you need to answer. The examiner is giving you ideas of what this place is situated in. So it's an instruction, and that's what we go with. You understand? All right, I noticed learners were talking various things on this paper. No, you go with the instruction. Clear, guys? All right, very, very important. Now, what did I do? I didn't stop here. I also looked at where it's on the map. So maybe I can get clearer answers when I look at that or get a clearer picture of what it is. Okay, so I looked there and I looked here. All right, I can see it's on the side of the slope here towards the middle. Okay, it's facing, look there, it's facing north. All right, uh, that shows you the settlement. That's the key there. The settlement, all right? And of course, that shows you trees, okay? But it's mostly on the settlement. Let's look at the questions. I can already smell something. Why is it here and the north is very clearly labeled? Can you see it's here also? <clears throat> and the north is clearly labeled, obviously, on your map. I've already worked it out. It can be aspect also, isn't it? Okay, so let's look at it. In which direction? does uh which direction does the settlement of bakamisa face which direction it is facing and when i look at this there's it here where is it facing no can you see it it's a north facing slope the warmer slope in the southern hemisphere and we know we're dealing with south african maps okay and that's how you worked it out Exam has given you big clues here. Eh? You can also see it on the map. It's not facing. Okay. So it's not. All right. So aspect of slope is just in a different way. Explain the climatological advantage. Action words, learners. Not just the advantage. The climatological advantage of the location of the settlement, Pakamisa. It's not facing slope, so it's warmer, isn't it? All right, so look at this. It's warmest part of the slope, receiving direct sunrise, sun uh, radiation, or direct radiation from the sun. Pakisa settlement is situated in the thermal belt, in the middle part of the slope, more or less in the middle. So the thermal belt is warm, isn't it? That's another answer, okay? And you know that you know what's a thermal belt, the cold air comes up uh, from it goes down due to catabatic flow and it forces the warm air up and the cold air from the top traps the warm air in the middle. It's a warm zone for settlements. Okay. All right. Okay, so limited if effect of the catabatic winds because it's found in the middle down there. So the catabatic winds come down, have limited effect on it. Okay, I'm not going to go through all the answers, but can you see how aspect as happens? Even I'll do one more. The settlement is not affected by frost during cold nights when you get frost. Because frost occurs near to the valley floor, and I mean near on the valley floor and near to the valley floor. That's where it occurs. Okay, the frost itself. Alright? So it has limited effect on the thermal belt. Okay, and there's of course there's various options. And again, just to be fully explained, as it says, explain one times two. You understand? So you can't say it's just the warmest part of the slope. You have to explain further. It will receive direct sun rays. You understand? Okay. So it's in the in the thermal belt. It's a warmer at night. Can you see it? Has to be fully explained. All right, let's go to the next question. I'll say I'm not going to do all options, but you're getting the idea. Explain the impact of catabatic winds will be minimal on the settlement. Now, that is your thermal belt because it's in the middle, hey? Eh? 
Therefore, it will be limited. So due to its location in the mid-slope or thermal belt, therefore, it's limited. You understand? I would like you to uh, put the full answer. You understand? It will be low because I know the question already said low. You understand? I like the full answer. All right? I know you'll get the marks. It's in the middle, so less effect by the catabatic winds. Cold air drains past Pakamisa into the valley below or the bottom of the slope. So it will go past Pakamisa, which is situated in the Dhamal Belt, and go below that. So that is what your answer should be focused on. Right, Pakamisa is not affected by frost that forms from catabatic winds as it is not on the valley floor or near the valley floor, isn't it? It's up here, so frost occurs here, yeah? it's not going to affect it down there. So it's about catabatic winds that have come up, but catabatic winds tested in a different way. Can you see? That is why applying, knowing your concepts, know to apply it. And you'll be applying different situations. Don't get scared of this. Yeah, we took the thermal belt and catabatic winds. It was taken here and it was applied together. So look at that, eh? Applying of different concepts. Okay. Right, let's look at this. This is your GIS now. GIS. Geographic information systems and i'm sorry i cut it out from the top but it should tell you on top the geographic information systems and yeah basically you need to know your concepts properly learners and you need to apply it okay once you know that and remember about just not knowing your concept know the difference between concepts you understand very very important and you should fly through this you understand many people has got a block towards gis no 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 no. you can fly through this you understand if you know that and apply it simple thing know how to apply it don't just wrote learn concepts without knowing what it means same like the rest of geography look at the example here is the topographic map raster or vector data all right now you need to know what is raster, what is vector. You understand? And you need to know the difference between them. Okay, raster data is represented by, or pre, on, a, on, on a photograph, etc., by pixels. You understand? Digital cells, it's a picture. Okay, uh, vector data is representation by using lines, polygons, you understand, points. And then all of a sudden, if you look at the topographic map, there are lines. Okay, there are points, okay, there are polygons, like the cultivated area, yeah, okay, so this is a picture, the autophoto, this is not a picture, okay, it's using lines, points, and polygons, so it has to be vector data, all right, can you see it, okay, now they ask you the difference. It's quite, nice, quite a nice set of questions uh, in Rasta's paper. Simple, all right? Rasta and vector data, what is the difference? Okay, right. Now watch out here. Don't just put them separately. You know the answers. Rasta data is represented by pixels, grid cells, whatever. If you just say it's represented by pixels, it's fine. You don't have to give all types. But an important word, Whereas vector data is represented as points, lines, and polygons. Whereas that is showing the difference. You put the first one and then you say, whereas vector data is like that. You have to show it, learners. It's one times two, meaning if you give one, no marks. You understand? And you write whereas. Very important. You understand? Showing the difference between the two. So you have to show the difference between the two. Okay, let's go on. Image A, image B, right, was captured by a remote sensing device. You can see there's clarity here. And there's lack of clarity here. More pixels here, eh? All right, but this device has got high pixels. Yeah, it's less, eh? All right, so there's various other reasons, 
but we can see where we're heading now. Watch this. All right. What is remote sensing? All right. Remember, it's a concept he has given us obtaining information about the Earth's surface from a distance, okay, without touching or, or without any physical contact. To make it safe, you say, uh, obtaining information from a vertical uh, distance, right? From the Earth, okay? Or from taking it taking a photograph or taking an image of the earth from above taking an image of the earth sorry from a distance above because we know we can take photographs like this from a distance isn't it person is here and if you got those good lens you can photograph from here okay but remote sensing is this from a vertical distance all right can you see it okay so taking a photograph from a distance from above okay or obtaining information from a distance from above or obtaining information from a vertical distance so you're showing that or as they mentioned without touching or physical contact all right so it's above so definitions have slightly altered okay as i showed you in our presentations on gis okay you got that, so remote sensing. Right, then name one factor in the remote sensing process that will affect the resolution of the image. Why is one not as clear as the other? Okay, there's various conditions that you studied. Weather conditions, you can accept examples, cloudy days and whatever. One was taken when it wasn't cloudy. One was taken when it was very cloudy. Image can be there. Focusing, lack of focusing, the lenses, etc. may make it uh, blurred. Number of pixels, your common one. One has more pixels, clear image. One has less pixels, image is not so clear. Shadows. Can you see? Shadows can also make it not clear. The equipment, if you're using high quality equipment, it'll be more clearer. Can you see so many answers? Air pollution may make the picture less clear. You understand? This polluted air. Distance, if you're taking it from very far away, you understand? Very, very far away. You understand? It may be not so clear. Okay. Angle, scale, there's so many reasons. All you have to give was one reason. Then the next one, why does the image A have a higher resolution than image B? Okay, and many people wrote because it's clearer. Resolution tells you that. Okay, it's asking why do you think? So people must interpret certain questions. It already tells you it has a higher resolution. You understand? Don't rewrite the question. Now you have to find reasons. And the reason is simple. You've been doing it all the time. That this little one will have more pixels, isn't it? For clarity. So uh, more smaller pixels or grid cells. You understand? Less larger pixels uh, than cell B. So more pixels is the thing. All right. More pixels, more clarity or more megapixels, more clarity. So it has more pixels, it will be more clear. Let's get simplified, all right? Okay, more pixels, clearer, that's it. Okay, so tell us which one. There's more pixels in A, being used in A, in image A, than B. That's the thing, because that is the important thing. And that's what gives you two marks. All right, don't say more pixels only. All right, say which one has more pixels. Because if you just wrote more pixels, zero. We don't know, maybe B as you're saying, B has more pixels. But he's saying A has more pixels, therefore there's clarity. All right, you've got it, learners? Simple. But remember, it's two marks, answer fully. All right, this one is buffering in block H8 down here. All right, showing you a river and buffering okay what's again what is buffering could be the same thing as define buffering you understand what is buffering define buffering 
Okay, so don't get confused. It's a demarcation of an area around or along a spatial feature. Right? Don't say object. Object can be this little glass here. Right? And it's not around. It's around a spatial feature location. You understand? But spatial feature is a good way of putting it. All right? So it's a zone around that. If the river was there, you buffer here. Okay, so it's around or along the way. All right, so let's look at this. Why would lack of buffering be considered poor river management in block H8? Why lack of buffering? There's your river here, All right? There's your river here, All right? And if we don't have buffering, we don't create a zone here to protect this. Why would it be poor river management? And people are just reading uh, uh, and giving general answers of poor river management. You have to be specific to this. What is around here? All the cultivated lands and whatever, you understand? Orchards and things like that all around this area. They are using a lot of fertilizers and whatever. And if you don't buffer this river, you understand? We've got problems. We may pollute that river. Can you see it? So it's simple things that you've been done before, but tested slightly differently. But it's more or less the same answers. Learners, we have to read. Lack of buffering, okay, will cause a poor river management. Can you see? River. So can you have to read carefully? So then the answers become simple. Simple. Fertilizer pesticides from farming could enter the river. You can see it from here, agriculture. It could disrupt the aquatic ecosystems, isn't it? Because the pollution gets in and uh, aquatic river systems are very sensitive, they die. All right, the river could lose water due to excessive irrigation. Okay, if you don't buffer there and you have it right there, more water will be used on for farming here. You understand? Biodiversity of the river is... Uh, threatened, isn't it? The different species, etc., from the Silver River. Some may die off. Okay, can you see that? The important thing to poor river management. All right, flooding may result in the rivers. Can you see? Soil erosion may silt up the rivers because we're removing any activity right there. So there's so many that we could look at, but it's about river management. Can you see it? Catchment and river management, etc part of your work of geomorphology and it's linked to buffering okay but also reading the question carefully lack of buffering leading to poor river management okay have you got that learners right let's look at this now next one refer to data integration okay in block h10 okay Data integration in block H10. Now we are the question asks, what is data integration? And we have people putting answers like uh, putting layers on uh, of, uh, um, information on top of one another, etc. That is uh, integration to a, a uh, uh, or rather it is integration, but it's one type of integration, right? You don't always put information on top of one another. You understand? You can combine statistics that can make it data integration. So we have to be careful. We need to know the slight difference between uh, data layering and data integration. Okay, so now we put a more general one here, taking information from different sources and combining it. Doesn't necessarily just be on top of one another. Okay, the layers of information. Can you see it? the difference between them? All right, this was nice that we showed data integration. All right, what is it now? Read this one. A farmer in block H10 wants to extend the size of his farm to I10, meaning the farmer here wants to extend his farm here. Okay. Name two physical natural layers. Natural layers. All right that the farmer would have to integrate in order to make a decision. 
all right it talks about integrating the layers you understand uh, how you would lose steep land uh, or gentle slopes and uh, proper water supply etc those are examples now remember eh? all right i want to make that clear also when we talk rivers we're giving examples of the layer when we talk drainage you understand we talk about the layer so please learners when we talk about topography that is the layer you understand uh, gentle is aspects of it you understand when we talk natural vegetation that is the layer when we talk infrastructure that is the layer can you see it it's not the examples of it the road when it's transport you understand we have to talk about the layer and you can give an example if you want to the examiners have made it quite nice here yeah? then then fully integrate they just gave you the different layers that you had to give and the answer was answered very simply thanks to them all right it says you'll have to consider drainage or hydrology layer to ensure sufficient water supply can you see the layer is being used that's the name of the layer the river is an example of it or whatever water processes is an example of it so drainage or there to ensure enough water supply wouldn't you look at the drainage in the area see the amount of rivers or canals leading through the area you'll have to consider that if he wants to extend his farm isn't it then you look at the topography or relief to assess the gradient of the slope isn't it you look at the topography of the area to see whether it's steep or gentle but if you just wrote steep or gentle you understand it didn't name the layer it's a problem also isn't it so put the layer on forget about the integration here now this is what the examiners wanted here and they gave it to us as answers like this okay i know there's various ways of doing it okay then you looked at the geological to determine the type of soil and fertility the geological what type of rock structures etc that will provide fertile soil and if you just wrote fertile soil it's not the layer all right and then of course the natural vegetation to determine the availability of grazing land all right but i think the important thing is about a layer is not an ex uh, the example you get is the river the drainage is the layer itself all right and this was an explanation of that all right learners i hope you uh made sense of the map work and i hope you realize again that this is not difficult all right it's about applying the concepts it's about that and you may get different things in the next paper all right but know your information on the topographic map orientate the map to the photo look at the information in the side if the examiner refers you to block h10 c block h10 then he refers to you to i10 refer c it apply your theory into it you understand and you should be okay i wish you all the best for your exams all right uh, and uh, further success in the future okay all the best learners goodbye